God will bless his word to us tonight too because this is the very subject that we're going to be thinking about. But first of all, let me welcome you. It's good to see you here. Thanks to those who are joining us live on Facebook. We trust that God will bless each one of us. Now, just a few announcements. First of all, Friday, there will be no Friday Bible study this week. What is it? A cataract done this week, so just remember him as we will be later on in prayer. But there is no Friday uh, Bible study this week. Lord's Day, as was announced, will be Children's Day, so that's a very special day. We'd love to see the children up taking part, so remember that. Ten o'clock, I think they're joining as well. Sunday school for a practice, and there is no Bible class that is now finished for the season. 11.30 will be our morning meeting, and of course, the breaking of bread, and then at night, we'll begin our prayer time at a quarter to six, and that will precede our evening service. David Miller will be speaking at both services, and the children, of course, from the Sunday school will be taking part. Those are all the announcements at the moment. They're made subject, as always, to the sovereign will of God. Now, let's read the scriptures together, and then we'll pray and commend ourselves to the Lord. Two short readings tonight. You thought you were finished with the book of Ephesians, but we're going to read a few verses in Ephesians 1, and uh, it's just to make reference to something. And then we'll have our second reading, just the first three verses of 1 John and chapter 3. So Ephesians 1, verse 1, first of all. Ephesians 1, verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Then let me read for you just the first three verses, 1 John 3. You don't need to look it up, but if you wish to do that, then please do. But 1 John 3 verse 1 says this, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Amen. God will bless these readings. 
from his word tonight. Let's just bow for a moment together as we pray. Father, we thank you for this lovely Wednesday night that enables us to gather here together around your word and also in the place of prayer. We thank you for this beautiful day, for all the blessings of it. Indeed, our Father, we thank you for every blessing that you bestow upon these lives of ours. From we have got out of bed today right through until we go to bed tonight, Father, your banner over us has been love. And we thank you that no matter what we have faced today, we have been conscious, we've been assured of your presence with us. And we thank you for every provision you've made for us. We recognize that we are nothing without Christ. We deserve nothing. And yet, our Father, you've given us all things richly in him to enjoy. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have again as a group of your people to meet together here in this place. Thank you for all who are in the building and for those who are joining us at home on Facebook Live. We just commend each one of us to you. You know the day that we have each one come through. You know the circumstances that are part of our journey in life. You know those things that encourage us and those other things that from time to time can vex and annoy us and therefore our father we thank you that whatever the circumstances we find ourselves in we can say with the psalmist my times are in thy hands and my god i wish them there thank you for the opportunity again to read your word publicly and thank you father for the opportunity we'll have just now in a few moments to open up your word to meditate upon it and to hear what God the Lord will say to us. So bless each one of us. Some perhaps have come through a difficult day, some tired from the events of the day. Father, we just ask that you would help us as we listen to your word to be encouraged and to be nurtured in our faith. Father, we remember tonight those who would love to be with us, but for whatever reason can't be here. We understand that everybody's circumstances are very different. But Father, for those who'd love to be here and cannot, maybe some in hospital, others who are unwell at the moment, some because of duty in the home or at work can't be amongst our number. Father, would you bless them as we look forward to your blessing upon us this evening. So hear our prayers, O God, and bless us now as we come before you in the worthy and precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, you remember, remember last week that we had commenced a little series of studies that I'm simply calling the ships of Scripture. I think some people were a wee bit confused about that. They thought I was going to speak about boats, but I'm not going to do boats. And then I went home and thought about the number of times we see the word boats in the scriptures, so maybe that's for another time. But what we're thinking about over these few weeks leading into the summer are things like stewardship, sonship, fellowship, discipleship, hardship, and of course, the lordship of Christ. So that's where we're going, not in any particular order, just as the Spirit of God leads us week by week. Last week, we addressed the subject of stewardship and it's a very challenging one and yet it's something that we as believers in Jesus Christ have to face honestly and biblically. We looked at the definition of the term and very simply whenever you and I think about the term steward maybe we think about many different things but when we think about this in a biblical way a steward was someone who looked after someone else's property. And that's a very important thing. The Apostle Paul, when he was talking about stewardship, he enlarged it, but he said himself that he was a steward of the mysteries of God. In other words, that had been entrusted to him. The word of God and the gospel, the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ had been entrusted to him. And Paul saw that he had to be a good steward of what God had given to him. So in Christian terms, a steward is someone entrusted with someone else's property and possessions. And as stewards tonight, whether we have little or whether we have much, what we have 
ultimately belongs to God and we are to make sure we use our resources wisely. The application of this term, it means being responsible with our time, being responsible with our money and being responsible with our gifts. These are all aspects of our Christian life that we have got to take heed to. And you say to me, why? Well, we thought about the importance of the term. Why do we put an emphasis on something like stewardship? I mean, after all, it's not something that crops up time and time again. The word, at least, although there are passages of Scripture where we're reminded of the importance of it. And what I'm saying is this. Paul told the Corinthian believers, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man is found faithful. We live in a world where when we think about people and what they have, we talk about being successful. Success doesn't really matter to God in monetary terms. What he wants is his servants to be faithful, good, faithful stewards. Now, tonight we come to the second one, and I'm going to deal <coughs> with the subject of sonship. And this, to me, is one of the most encouraging ones that we could think about during these weeks together, because sonship is a great theme. And the two passages that we have read together tonight help us to understand not just the blessing of sonship in the fact that you and I are the sons and the daughters of God and part of his spiritual family. But from that, there are blessings that flow to the child of God that are such an encouragement to us, not just today and tomorrow, but all our tomorrows until Jesus comes or perhaps Jesus calls. I'm turning especially to 1 John 1, but I'll be referring back again for a moment to those verses in Ephesians 1. You see, 1 John 3, John reminds these believers of their great position in Christ. And he reminds them that they were the sons and daughters of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this or we know that. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this open him purifies himself even as he is pure. Beloved, your life and mine tonight should be enriched by the fact that you and I are the sons and the daughters of God. Sometimes when I go up home, and that's not very often, but maybe I would be up home and, and somebody will meet me that I haven't seen for years and they'll say to me, I can't remember your name, but I know that you're young Taylor. I knew your father. I knew your father. So they didn't know me, but they knew my father. And they knew that as a result of that, that I was a son of this man who was my father. Wouldn't it be great as you and I live out our Christian lives, that people could look at us and know, yes, that we have had an earthly father, some of whom, like mine, are already in the glory. But to know that we have a heavenly father, why? Because we're like him. Because we're like him. You know, as believers tonight, we should be enriched to know that we are the sons and the daughters of God. That's something that gives us great assurance as we journey through life with all its ups and downs. It warms our hearts to know that we have a loving, heavenly Father who is not only intimately related to us through faith in Jesus Christ, but he's someone tonight who knows all about us and who cares for us continually. Such a privilege to know that you and I can come to him at any time under any circumstances and we can come into his presence with the words on our lips, Abba, Father. 
Just by way of introduction, let me say this so there's no confusion. The term Father is applied to God in several ways in the Bible, and I'm just going to mention these in passing. Firstly, he's the Father of creation. In other words, there is a universal fatherhood whereby God is seen to be the Father of everything that he has created. Secondly, he's a father to Israel. Remember that God chose the nation of Israel on the basis of his grace, not because they were a mighty nation, because they weren't. In fact, they were the least of all the nations in the world at that time. But God in his grace set his hand upon them, drew them to himself, and he made them his very own special possession. Now, despite their indifferences from time to time toward God and their lack of love for God, he made them his own. He cared for them. He led them. He fed them. He watched over them continually because they were his children. Thirdly, he's the father of all who believe. In other words, he's our father tonight on the basis of our redemption. You think about that. You just think about what you are tonight as a son and a daughter of God, and you think about what you have. God is your Father. Christ is your Savior. The Holy Spirit is your Comforter. The great triune God is the one tonight that we're able to come to, and he's able to say, you're mine. You're mine. On the basis of our redemption. Fourthly, he's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, as far as that relationship is concerned, he has been that from eternity past. He's our Father on the basis of our redemption. He has a unique, intimate relationship with his Son that goes right back into eternity past. Take a look sometime. We'll not do it tonight. Take a look sometime at the number of times when God spoke about Jesus and referred to him as my son. Listen to the Lord Jesus throughout his earthly ministry and you will hear him talk about my father. And when he spoke to the disciples, he spoke about your father because the relationship was a different relationship. But John says here in 1 John 3, Beloved, what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Listen to another translation. I think this is the way that Charles Spurgeon put it, and I think these words are beautiful. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. And we are. Right now, because of grace, that's who we are. Three things very, very quickly. Number one, the declaration of our position. John says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Now, lover, that's not just a glorious position. That's a wonderful privilege. We were all taught in early days, I'm sure, way back in school days or Sunday school days, how to say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And sometimes I be in situations where everyone will say, or somebody at the front will say, now we're all God's children. Let's say the prayer that Jesus taught us together. Our Father. I often sit and say to myself, there are multitudes of people in this meeting, sitting in this hall, making a prayer, and they don't know him. Our Father. He is only our Father on the basis of our redemption. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. And Paul just doesn't say that God loves us. And John just doesn't say that God loves us. John underlines it here, the extent of his love, when he says the Father has lavished his love upon us. Lavished. 
Remember in the gospel account how that when John gave us his opening comments in John chapter 1, referring to the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Remember he goes back, unlike the other gospel writers who begin with the birth and other aspects of it, he goes right back into eternity in the beginning was the word. And then he comes through, right through until John 1, 10 and 12. And of the Lord Jesus, he said this. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came on to his own and his own received him not. That his own is his own people, Israel. And he came as their Messiah. He left heaven, came as a babe into Bethlehem's manger, came on to his own people, Israel, they knew him not. They still don't. After all these years. But here's what he said. John said, as many as received him, to them give he the power, the authority, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You and I have believed. You and I know him as our saviour. And that's why you and I have been brought in love and in grace into this unique and privileged position as the sons and daughters of God. Go back to what I read to you in your mind for a moment in Ephesians 1. Remember how the Apostle Paul uses that great term? He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, then he lists them for us. We've been chosen in Christ before the very foundation of the world. That's a mysterious thing. Sometimes it's hard to understand God's electing grace, but not only were we chosen, but before the very foundation of the world. And then he says also, he says, look, we are accepted in the well-beloved. You imagine that. You and I who were strangers to grace and to God. We who were once enemies of God, alienated because of our sin. And yet, Paul says, you're no longer alienated. You're no longer the enemies of God because we're the sons and daughters of God, those who have been brought nigh by precious blood, accepted in the well-beloved. He says we're numbered amongst the redeemed in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And then he says this great statement. He says that we have been adopted into the family of God, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, beloved, here's the amazing thing about that. Not only do you and I have a standing before God tonight that makes us accepted in the well beloved, but we stand before him as his sons and his daughters, part of that great spiritual family that transcends a local church and every local church in this land and goes right out to the ends of the earth through the gospel that is taken out to them and that great number in heaven from every tribe and tongue and nation, part of this great family, the family of God. And that's where you and I are tonight. The Apostle Paul in Romans 8 emphasizes this. He says, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are who? The children of God. And of children, heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You maybe never grasp this, but you should grasp it tonight. You and I have a highly honored status. 
We're the children of God, sons and daughters. We have great wealth tonight. And I'm not talking in monetary terms. I'm talking in the terms that Paul uses. Not only are we the sons and the daughters of God, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, all that is his is ours because we're part of the same family. The declaration of our position, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Here's the second thing, the delight of our prospect. Look at what John says in verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. That's established. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, there are many people tonight who will say to us as believers, listen, you can't be sure about that. You can't know that with any certainty. I can assure you this. If the Bible says that we know, then we know. It's there in black and white. God has placed it here within the book that he has given to us as we thought about in Ephesians 6. And John says here, we know. We know. What do we know? He says we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. You see, for me, that's some of my most favorite verses in the whole of the Bible. Because as the sons and daughters of God, not only have we so much to rejoice in right now, we have so much to look forward to in the future. Sometimes as believers, we dwell in the past and we live in the past. Now we learn lessons from the past. It must never become an anchor to hold us back in our growth with God. Because you and I tonight have a wonderful future to look forward to. Let me explain it like this. Firstly, we have a blessed hope. John simply says here, we know that when he shall What great words those are. In a world that's falling apart in the seams, when you and I look around us and say, is there an answer to this? What's going to happen there? I don't know. I know this, he shall appear. He shall appear. That's what the Bible says. John tells us what we are and what we shall be, what our future holds for us, and he says, he shall appear. What a blessed hope the child of God has tonight. The God who in his love and mercy has saved us, has brought us every step of the way and given us every spiritual blessing in Christ. And one day he'll bring everything to completion. Now I know that the second coming of Christ is always and will continue to be, I suppose, a divisive issue for many people because of the diverse uh, views that they hold on this subject. But you know, don't get bogged down with some of these things. You have your position, that's fine. You might be right, you might be wrong. But there is one thing you can be sure about. Jesus is coming again. We know he shall appear. That's a truth that scripture declares again and again and again. And that's why as believers, we must never lose hope. Some of the most hopeless looking people in our world today are Christians. And yet they have got the most hope. And the people who have no hope are running around with a smile on their face, not caring about what happens in the future, I care what happens in the future because I'm looking forward to that day when he shall come. He shall appear, John says. But we need to be looking up with a sense of expectancy for Jesus is coming again. 
Remember how in John 14, as the Lord Jesus spoke to his downcast, discouraged disciples, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there, you may be also. Acts 1, 9 to 11, the disciples are gathered together as a little group. The Lord Jesus is ascending before them and they hear these words. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apollo, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Number 1 Thessalonians 4. The believers there in Thessalonica couldn't work it out in their heads about death and then the Lord coming and what would happen to those who had already died what's going to happen when Jesus comes so Paul tells them I would not have you to be ignorant Paul says brethren concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord, we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be. Where? With the Lord. With the Lord. Hallelujah tonight. King's coming. The King is coming. Paul says to the Thessalonians who were confused, he says, look, comfort one another with these words. The King is coming. And that's the Christian's blessed hope. We know he shall appear. But secondly, we will have a blessed change. John says we shall be like him. We shall be like him. Can you imagine what that will be like? All of us tonight as God's children, I'm sure there are times... We look at our lives, lives that are filled with imperfections. I know when we look at each other, we expect each other to be perfect. You're looking in the wrong place and you're looking for the wrong time. We look at ourselves, we lament the fact we're not everything we should be. We look at our hearts and we confess there are times when we're complacent and we're careless and lukewarm. We look at our failures and wonder why so often we fall short of the mark. Beloved, there's a day coming when that all's going to change. John says here, we know he shall appear. And when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Do you struggle tonight with your health? Do you struggle with your mind? Do you struggle with things in life that really get you down and you can't wait to get out of this earthly tabernacle? Hold on, he's coming. And you know what the Bible says about this? There's going to be a release from our earthly tabernacle. We'll all be changed. We're going to be changed into the likeness of Christ. We'll never be as equal but will bear his likeness. Those words, Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be what? 
fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. I might have told you this before, it's worth repeating. I remember just a few weeks, not long after I was saved, my pastor then said he was going to New Cumlick to do a weekend of meetings, Harold Chambers. He says, John, will you come with me for company and for experience? And I went with him and we laughed the whole weekend. But you know, he says to me, and it put the laughing out of me, I want you to give your testimony on Sunday morning which I gladly did. And then he preached on these verses I've read to you in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. He shall change your vile body like unto a glorious body like his. And after he quoted that, he prayed it was over. Before the people ever moved off their seats, this young girl in her early 20s pushed herself up right up the middle of the church in a wheelchair. She looked up and said, I'll not always be like this. Well, I'll not always be like this. If I annoy you from time to time, don't worry when we get to heaven, it won't happen. Beloved, with a blessed hope for Christ is coming again. And with a blessed change to look forward to, we really won't always be like this. For we'll have a glorious body fashioned like God. Here's the third thing quickly. The declaration of our position, the delight of our prospect, the desire for our purity. Look at verse 3. Every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. This is the practical side. We have been thinking about other things tonight, but this is something every believer should really desire. John tells us what we are right now. And he tells us what we're going to be in a day that is yet to come. But then he says what we should do in the light of that day. Every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Beloved, you see what John means? It's simple. Since you and I enjoy this blessed hope, since you and I have this great prospect that he shall come, then you and I should seek to be pure and holy when he comes. We sang tonight with such a blessed hope in view, we would more holy be, more like our glorious risen Lord whose face we soon shall see. You say, Pastor, what's the point in worrying about this? Because you've told us already one day we're going to be changed, yes. We shouldn't wait for that day to be changed. We should be changing every day and being conformed into the image of our lovely Savior. You see, the more we think about what lies ahead, the more we should continually strive for holiness of life down here. And W. Tozer said this, no Christian is where he ought to be spiritually till the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ is being reproduced in his daily Christian life. Or to sum it up, in that little chorus perhaps we used to sing years ago, to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus, all I ask, is to be like him all through life's journey from earth to glory all I ask is to be like him we're the sons and daughters of God what a glorious position that is and we'll soon see the Lord Jesus Christ one day and what a glorious prospect that is sons and daughters of God tonight and that means so much and let's make sure we don't lose sight of that behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God beloved now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be for we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him 
for we shall see him as he is. Every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. May God encourage our hearts tonight and help us to keep looking up. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. He may come even sooner than we could ever think. And we bless you, our Father, when he comes, that we're going to go to be with him. And we'll be like him. And we'll be with him throughout the countless ages of eternity. The truth is, our Father, that there are times we just can't fathom that. For we look at ourselves and we wonder what you ever saw in us. But in your grace and mercy, you've brought us to know Christ. We're part of your family. We not only have a blessed position in life, we have a blessed prospect for the future. Help us to rejoice in these things. We thank you, Father, that you ever lavished your love upon us. We thank you for it. We bless your holy name as we pray in Christ's name.